Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So when we talk about companions of the Prophet وسلم, who have a story which is completely glory and it's this uphill trajectory, you can admire them and you can marvel at their righteousness and their virtue and you can come away from that thinking, you know, subhanAllah, I'll never be at that level. And honestly, that is the story of Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu, right? When we're talking about the three poets of the Prophet وسلم, the story of Abdullah ibn Rawaha that we covered radiallahu anhu is a man who was a warrior, a worshiper, a poet, someone who you just see complete devotion and you don't really see him trip up at any point in his biography. And then we moved on to Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu who you see makes a mistake but the mistake that he makes is not one that causes you any type of, of serious aversion, right? It's, okay, he got distracted by his circumstances and his story of repentance and redemption is absolutely beautiful. He used to fight in the battles in general and he missed out uh, a couple of battles for whatever reason. And then you get to the story of Hassan ibn Thabit ta'ala anhu and you come across a man who actually does get tripped up but for not a moment do we ever think that we're better than any of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, especially not someone who was supported by Jibreel in his craft, in the things that he used to do. And so the story of Hassan ibn Thabit anhu is refreshingly complex in that the lessons that we can take from the story are so numerous and so relevant and direct to us ta'ala. So I'm actually very excited uh, about covering Hassan uh, Ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu Again, the opening scene You walk into the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And you see the minbar of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam You see the pulpit of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And then a few feet away you see another pulpit And it is not like the pulpit that the Messenger would speak from alayhi salatu wa salam But it's a pulpit that a man would stand up on and defend the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the lyrics of poetry would come striking against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who was always patient with his enemies. And you have a man who's an artist, Hassan ibn Thabit, the master of all poets, Sayyid al-Shu'ara, the greatest poet of all time, we can say as believers, the greatest poet of all time, standing up and defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, extolling his honor, and humiliating his enemies who seek to humiliate him alayhi salatu wasalam. So if you walk into the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu man, who is this person that has a minbar, that has a pulpit in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? And so we start off once again with the shu'ara. You'll remember this for the rest of your life, inshallah. When someone asks you, who are the poets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? You'll easily be able to say who? Say them really quickly for me, inshallah. Abdullah ibn Rawaha. Ka'b ibn Malik and Hassan ibn Thabit, the three poets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As we said, Abdullah ibn Rawaha was the man whose poetry surrounded the virtue of belief over disbelief. And Ka'b ibn Malik would speak of the courage of the Muslims and the believers and the victorious days of the believers and would speak about the cowardice of the enemies of the believers. And Hassan ibn Thabit had the type of poetry, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he would crucify the enemy with his words and he would bring out their flaws and essentially demonstrate superiority in that way. Now when we get to his story, it's very interesting, subhanAllah, to study the world around him. And this is something you typically won't hear in a lecture about Hassan ibn Thabit or reading about him. And this first three minutes is for the note takers, inshallah. The background of Hassan ta'ala is actually fascinating. It's actually significant. So Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu from a family perspective is from Banu Najjar of Khazraj. These are the maternal relatives of the Prophet sallallahu So in a way he's going to be a distant relative of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Medina. Banu Najjar is the same family that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari comes from, the same family of Umm Sulaym, Umm Haram, the maternal relatives of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he's from that sub-tribe of uh, Khazraj and he was a famous poet from a very young age and he's probably the only Arab poet or from that area that was famous throughout the world. Um, his fame was not limited to Medina. Now in Medina 
you have two tribes that are fighting each other, obviously from the Ansar, Aus and Khazraj, right? Aus and Khazraj are the two tribes from Yemen that make up the Ansar, and they had these tribal differences. So Hassan was the poet of Khazraj against Aus, okay? The poet from Aus was a man by the name of Qais ibn al-Khatim. Qais ibn al-Khatim. And Qais ibn al-Khatim also lived to see Islam, but he did not embrace Islam when it came to him, and he died shortly after he learned about the Prophet wasallam. So basically, these were the two poets that would face off. Aus and Khazraj would fight with their spears and their arrows. Hassan ibn Thabit from Khazraj and Qais ibn al-Khatim. Uh, Ibn al-Khatim from al-Aws. So they'd face off. So Qais died uh, shortly after the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina. The wife of Qais became a companion, became a Sahabiya. Her name is Hawa bint Yazid. Hawa bint Yazid. So you have Hawa bint Yazid radiallahu anha, the wife of the poet of Aws who passed away, not as a Muslim. And then you have Hassan ibn Thabit, the main poet of Khazraj. And as I said last week, and I'm just being real, his poetry was mean. His poetry would literally take the enemy and just split them into pieces. And so what he ends up doing is he starts getting invited by the kings of the world to basically go there and put down their enemies and put down their opponents. And it's even said, subhanAllah, so he was called by the Ghassasina in Syria. He goes to Syria. He, he has lines of poetry for the Romans. And he also goes to the Persians, who of course are the rivals of one another, the Romans and the Persians. But Hassan manages to sneak between all of the elites of the world and deliver poetry on their behalf. So it was not uncommon to walk into a palace at that time in different parts of the world and Hassan stand up and Hassan radiallahu anhu would just go. And no poet stood a chance against Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So his prominence is sort of around the world, even though he's the poet of Khazraj against Aus. So Aus and Khazraj have, you know, they've got their issues. He puts down Aus, then he goes around the world, puts down people on behalf of different kings and leaders. That's kind of his reputation, right? His reputation is that genre of poetry. Now here's something very interesting when I say this is for the note takers. Hassan radiallahu anhu's two parents and all eight of his siblings actually became Muslim. They all became Sahaba. And this is fascinating, subhanAllah. His father, Thabit ibn Mundir, was in his 80s. And he embraced Islam. And he's one of the veterans of Badr, according to Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, which would have made him probably, if not the oldest Sahabi at Badr, one of the oldest companions at the Battle of Badr. His mother, Al-Furay'a, Al-Furay'a bint Khalid. Sorry, Dallas allergies, it's happening. <clears throat> Al-Furay'a bint Khalid, radiallahu ta'ala anha, was so known for her intellect that Hassan at times would refer to himself as Ibn Al-Furay'a, the son of Al-Furay'a. So his mother was an intellectual woman was a smart woman and a noble woman as well. And she converted to Islam radiallahu ta'ala anha. You go through his siblings, both of his brothers. One of them, Abu Shaykh, Abu Shaykh ibn uh, uh, Thabit al-Ansari. Uh, so his brother Abu Shaykh was also a Sahabi. He witnessed Badr and Uhud and he died as a shaheed in Bit Ma'una. So he's a, a martyr. <coughs> His brother, Aus ibn Thabit, also becomes Muslim and witnesses the battles and passes away as, uh, as, as, a, as a shaheed as well. So a sahabi and a shaheed. And the reason why this is going to get interesting is because you'll see how different these siblings actually end up becoming. Because anyone who has multiple kids can tell you they don't all come out the same way, right? Kepsha bin Thabit. We go to his sisters. He has a sister by the name of Kepsha bin Thabit. Kepsha bin Thabit. Kepsha has one hadith, and it's so beautiful. She narrates one hadith in the entire tradition, and she narrates that the Prophet visited her home one day, and he, she had a, a water skin that was hanging in her home, and Rasulullah took that water skin and he drank from it, and she said, I cut the top of it where the Prophet drank from, and I kept it with me for the rest of my life. That's her one 
hadith from Kapsha bint Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anha uh, in a Tirmidhi. I also found a Lubna bint Thabit. So shout out to the Lubnas there. We found the Lubna who's a Sahabiya. Lubna uh, bint Thabit radiallahu anha was present at the bay'ah with the Prophet sallallahu She took allegiance with the Prophet sallallahu He then has a sister named Layla bint Thabit radiallahu anha who is also a companion. And then lastly, two sisters, Fari'a bint Thabit, Fari'a, the daughter of Huraya, Fari'a, Fari'a bin Thabit and Khawla bin Thabit, both of whom were poets. Okay? Interesting eight siblings, radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So you have eight siblings, all became Muslim, and Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu was going to be one of them. Now Hassan was 60 years old when the Prophet got to Medina. Sometimes you lose the age of a person when you're thinking about context. He was 60. That's not common for someone to be that old in Medina. Why? Who can tell me why? Because they killed each other in Bu'ath. The elders killed each other in the wars, the tribal wars that existed before. So he's one of those that survived the Bu'ath wars because some of the, you know, and this is honestly at this point, interpretation. Some of the scholars said that <clears throat> perhaps it's because Hassan was known to never pick up a sword in his life. Not before Islam or after Islam. We're going to see this with Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu. He never picked up a sword. He was not a man of the battlefield radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Right? Some of them said perhaps it was his traveling around the world or, you know, maybe something else. But it's unlikely, right, that the poet, the man who was insulting Aus for a living, managed to escape the Bu'ath wars where people his age were killed. But he escaped. He's one of the few elders when the Prophet ﷺ comes to al Medina, And that makes him seven years older than the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, so he's actually older than the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, who came to Medina when he was 53 years old alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, the, the general story of Hassan ta'ala anhu is that he's a disartist. He puts you down. And so some of the people who were not happy about the Prophet وسلم, rising from Mecca, they basically hired Hassan, gave him some money and said, you know, go out and see this man. And when you see him, do your thing, right? Slice him into pieces. Find some flaws in him. And Hassan anhu, he wouldn't leave anything off. Your physical features, your background, the way you walk, the way you talk, everything about you was going to be put down in his poetry, right? So he goes out, he says, okay, I've done this before. Goes out, waits for the Prophet Sallallahu sees all these people in Medina who are excited about the Prophet Sallallahu coming. He's not phased, right? Okay, I've seen impressive people in my life. And when he sees the Prophet Sallallahu he automatically falls in love. I have nothing bad to say about this man. And the famous poem of Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, وَأَحْسَنُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَى قَدْتُ عَيْنِي وَأَجْمَلُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّأً مِنْ كُلِّ عِيبٍ كَأَنَّكَ قَدْ خُلِقْتَ كَمَا تَشَاءُ He said radiallahu ta'ala anhu, وَأَحْسَنُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَى قَدْتُ عَيْنِي That better than you, my eye has never seen before. It's Arabic to English, all right? My eye has never seen anything like you before. وَأَجْمَلُ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدِ النِّسَاءُ and more beautiful than you, no woman has ever given birth to. No woman has ever birthed a creature more beautiful than you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. خُلِقْتَ مُبَرَّأً مِنْ كُلِّ عَيْبٍ You were created without any flaws. There is no flaw in how you are, not in your physical appearance or in your character. كَأَنَّكَ قَدْ خُلِقْتَ كَمَا تَشَاءُ As if you were created exactly as you wished. It was as if you created yourself because of the way that you were, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this is his description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how impressed he was by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even if this wasn't said at the initial appearance, it gives you an idea that Hassan radiallahu anhu saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, this is him, this is it. I have nothing to say bad or negative about this man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and indeed he never actually did. Now before we get to his poetry, this is where you start to see the differences in the companions. Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu would not fight in a battle. And when we say would not fight in a battle, it wasn't like he kind of was afraid. Hassan, for whatever reason, 
could not see the battlefield and did not witness a single battle alongside the Prophet ﷺ, which indicates that this was a serious fear that he had and an anxiety <coughs> that he had uh, from the battlefield. And <coughs> this is narrated by more than one um, of the uh, authors that not a single battle was he with the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to stay back because of his condition. So it wasn't simply that I don't feel like it. It wasn't like I used to fight in Jahliya, I used to fight in the days of ignorance, and now when Islam comes, I'm not really committed to this. It's that I really cannot be in the battlefield in any capacity whatsoever. <clears throat> now, one of the narrations you might remember is from Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anha. <coughs> I'm sorry, can I have a tissue? <coughs> Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib was the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she was the mother of Az Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And remember, Az Zubair was known as Ibn Safiya, the son of Safiya, because Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib raised Az Zubair by herself. Right? She was a single mom. She raised him by herself, and she was an extremely strong woman. So if you go back to her biography, which we covered ages ago, you'll find this incident where when the Battle of the Trench was taking place, Khandaq was taking place, Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha was with the women and the children, and they were in one of the fortresses, hiding obviously from the oncoming massacre. Right. Now what happened? Khaybar, uh, Bani Quraidah, obviously betrays and breaks the covenant and seeks to attack the women and the children from the inside. So Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala anha is in this area with the women and the children and with them was Hassan ibn Thabit. Now mind you, Hassan ibn Thabit is almost 70 years old. So he's also an elderly man, right? He's not just a poet who never goes into the battlefield, he's an elderly man. So. <clears throat> She sees someone, she sees the figure of a man coming to attack them, and she tells Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, she says, you know, go ahead and do something about it, right? Can you go and attack him? And he says, يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكِ يَا بِنْتِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ عَرَفْتِ مَا أَنَا بِصَاحِبِ هَذَا May Allah forgive you, O daughter of Abdul Muttalib, you know, I'm not the one for this. It's not my thing. Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet an elderly woman, what does she do? She goes and she takes a pole, she waits till the man gets close to the door, and then she pops him on the head with the pole. She pulls his body in, and she says to Hassan radiallahu anhu, Hassan is scared, he's terrified by what he's witnessing. She says to Hassan radiallahu anhu, Ya Hassan, anzil fastalibhu. Hassan, get, you know, go ahead and take his stuff off, right? Get, go through his stuff. And she says, the only thing that's stopping me from doing it, annahu rajul, is that he's a man. So I'm not going to go into his, his stuff and take out his weapons. And he said, I can't even do that. So Safiya, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, what does she do? She basically takes his body. All right, this is an old woman, but this is the mother of a Zubair. This is the type of mom that raises a Zubair radiallahu anhu. And she throws his body out. And when the people that were with that man saw the man's body fly out, they thought there was an army there. So they all went running away. So Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anha is the one who narrated this incident. So Hassan radiallahu anhu seriously could not, could not enter into the battlefield at all whatsoever. The man's battle was his poetry. That's what he could do. That's what he stuck to radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And you start to see the stories of how he would defend the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with his poetry. One narration. Uh, as the people were starting to author lyrics, and poetry was the art of the Arabs, right? <clears throat> as they started to author lyrics against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قَالَ قَائِلٌ يَعْلِي بْنِ أَبِي طَالِبُ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُمْ أُهْجُ عَنَّ الْقَوْمَ الَّذِينَ يَحْجُونَنَا Some of the people said to Ali رضي الله عنه, go ahead and respond. And he said, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gives me permission, فَعَلْتْ I will do so. The Prophet said about Ali radiallahu anhu, Inna Aliyan laysa indahu ma yuradu fi dhalika minhu. This is not Ali radiallahu anhu's specialty. He's an eloquent man, but Ali has no experience in this type of poetry. In these lyrics, he's not the one for this particular task. So the Prophet 
looks around the Prophet ﷺ, knows who's in the room at that time. He says, مَا يَمْنَعُ الْقَوْمُ الَّذِينَ نَصَرُوا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِسِلَاحِهِمْ أَنْ يَنْصُرُوهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ What's stopping the Ansar who took in the Prophet ﷺ and defended the Prophet ﷺ with all that they had with their weapons from defending him with their tongues? And Hassan anhu said, I, I got the cue, أَنَا لَهَا Ya Rasulullah, it's me. I've got this. In another narration, uh, Ka'b ibn Malik anhu said, Anna, me, and the Prophet ﷺ was quiet in that particular uh, setting. Abdullah ibn Rawaha said, Anna, me, and the Prophet ﷺ was quiet in that uh, setting. And Hassan said, Anna, me, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Na'um, you, uhjuhum anta, wa sayu'inuka alayhim ruhul qudus. You respond, and the angel Jibreel alayhi salam will support you. So it's you, Hassan. This task is for you. Now, as Hassan says, this is what I've been waiting for. This was my art before Islam. I put it aside, you know, when I became Muslim. Now it's my turn to get up there and to start responding with lyrics. The Prophet ﷺ says, wait a minute, but before you start, <laughs> he says, كيف تهجوهم وأنا منهم? How do you plan on authoring your lyrics against them when I am from them? Meaning Hassan's whole poetry was about where you came from, I mean your family and your tribe, and he put down everything about your tribe and everything about you. So the Prophet wasallam, he said that, you know, how is it that you're going to put them down when I'm one of them? He says, كَيْفَ تَهْجُوا أَبَا Sufyan, وَهُوَ ibn عَمِّي How are you going to put down Abu Sufyan? And he's my cousin, right? So he says, Wallahi. لا أسل لا منهم كما تسل الشعرة من العجين. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to take you out or extract you from them the way that you would take a hair out of the dough. Meaning, I've got this, Ya Rasulullah. I'll make sure that I attack them and I'm going to finally extract you from them when I go after them. And the Prophet says, Eti Abu Bakr, go to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, fa innahu a'lamu bi ansabi al qawmi mink. Abu Bakr who knows the lineage of everyone. So Hassan says, I've got this. So he goes to Abu Bakr anhu, and you could see Hassan going to Abu Bakr, taking notes, studying the people of Mecca. يَسْأَلُ عَنْ فُلَانْ وَفُلَانْ وَمَنْ فُلَانْ وَمَنْ ابْنُ فُلَانْ So he's asking, who's this person? Who's this person's father? Who's this person's daughter? Who's this per so he basically goes to Abu Bakr anhu, and gets all the, the tribes and the sub-tribes and all the lineage of Mecca because Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, knew uh, you know, everything about the people of Mecca. So once Hassan radiallahu anhu stands up and he starts to author his poetry and he goes into his lyrics and he starts dissecting all the tribes and the sub-tribes of Quraysh, somehow never touching the Prophet sallallahu and perfectly mentioning the maternal side and the paternal side when it was necessary, they look at him and they say, Wallahi inna hadha sha'r ما غاب عنه ابن أبي خحافة. He said, "This person, Wallahi, Abu Bakr has a hand in this. There's no way he knows all of this about us. Like there's no way this poet from Medina figured all this out about us and is so skilled at mentioning every single tribe and every single sub-tribe and everyone this and that, and then somehow never touching the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam." So in one of the uh, poems, and this is in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet وسلم, as he told Hassan anhu, to respond. This is so beautiful, and I'm gonna I'm gonna recite it in Arabic first. قال حسان هجوت محمدا فأجبت عنه وعند الله في ذاك الجزاء هجوت محمدا برا تقيا رسول الله شيمته الوفاء فإن أبي ووالده وعرضي لعرض محمد منكم وقاء فكلت بنيتي إن لم تروها تثير النقع من كنف كداء يبارين الأعنة مصعدات على أكتافها الأسل والضماء تظل حياد حيادنا تظل جيادنا متمطرات تلطموهن بالخمر النساء فَإِنْ أَعْرَضْتُمُ عَنَّا اَعْتَمَرْنَا وَكَانَ الْفَتْحُ وَانْكَشَفَ الْغِطَاءُ وَإِلَّا فَاصْبِرُوا لِضِرَابِ يَوْمٍ يُعِزُّ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ 
وقال الله قد أرسلت عبدا يقول الحق ليس له وقال الله قد أرسلت عبدا يقول الحق ليس به خفاء وقال الله قد يسرت جندا هم الأنصار عرضتها اللقاء لنا في كل يوم من معد سباب أو قتال أو هجاء فمن يهجو رسول الله منكم ويمدحه وينصره سواء وجبريل رسول الله فينا وروح القدس ليس له كفاء This is a long narration Sahih Muslim and I guarantee you that everyone in here who speaks Arabic got lost at some point uh, because it's very poetic. All right, so he says, I'm going to go through it a bit by bit, inshallah. He says, Hajouta Muhammadan fa'ajabtu anhu wa inda Allahi fi dhaka al jaza that you mocked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I responded on his behalf and I expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a reward. Hajouta Muhammadan barran taqiyan Rasulallahi shimatuhu al-wafa'u He says, you mocked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man of virtue and righteousness, the messenger of Allah whose nature is always wafa, whose nature is always uh, nobility and, and loyalty. And in, in essence, as some of the scholars would say, this is saying, you know, he doesn't respond on, on, on the part of himself because the lion doesn't respond to the barking dog. So you keep on barking at him, but you've mocked a man who is noble and who has absolutely nothing that you could find in him to mock him with. And he said, may my father, may my mother, may my honor be sacrificed for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, may I lose myself. Now when he says uh, in, in this part of it, uh, it actually means, may my daughter lose me. So he's not actually making dua against his daughter. He's saying that, may I perish if you don't see the horses going forward and kicking up the dust as they enter into Mecca. So he's praising the Muslims fighting back uh, against the humiliation. And he says, that these horses as they come forward have, uh, you know, th th they go upwards and on their shoulders are spears that are thirsting for their enemies. So he starts to praise the horses and he starts to praise the armies uh, as they are coming uh, forward. And he says, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضْتُمُوا عَنَّا اعْتَمَرْنَا وَكَانَ الْفَتْحُ Or actually before that, تَظَلُّوا جِيَادُنَا مُتَمَطِّرَاتٍ تُلَطِّمُهُنَّ بِالْخُمُرِ النِّسَاءُ Which basically means that the women are wiping the sweat off of the horses, uh, the horses' steeds because of the, 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 the eagerness of the horses. You see, this is why it gets awkward to translate poetry. But the horses, as they're going forward with such zeal, with people of zeal on them, the, the women are wiping off the sweat from those horses who show absolutely no sign of letting up. And he says, uh, If you would have left us alone, we would have done Umrah. Because what was happening here, they ran them out of Mecca, they persecuted them, and now they violated all the rules of sanctity. They're not letting them carry out their Umrah, their pilgrimage. So if you would have let us go forth for our Umrah, then we would have gone forth. And the opening would have came, and the veil of darkness would have been lifted. But if not, then be ready. For a day that Allah will honor whom He wishes. Of course, as we said, Hassan is not going to be on the battlefield, but He's praising those that will be on the battlefield for that day. And Allah said, I have sent to you a servant with the truth. And there is no ambiguity whatsoever about his message. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ قَدْ يَسَّرْتُ جُنْدًا هُمُ الْأَنصَارُ عُرْضَتُهَا اللِّقَاءُ And Allah says, I have sent forth a group of people from the Ansar. And they have absolutely nothing that is holding them back. They are determined to fight. And he goes on to say, um, لَنَا فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِنْ مَعَدٍ سِبَابٌ أَوْ قِتَالٌ أَوْ هِجَاءُ Every day we hear from you people, does anyone know who Ma'ad is? Ma'ad is uh, Banu Adnan, it's the Meccans. So he's saying, we, we always get from you people, your abuses, your mockery, your, your, uh, your attacks. Like you've been picking on us for all of these years, attacking us for all of these years, and we've never had a day where we have not dealt with the abuse that comes from you. 
your tongues or your hands or whatever it may be. فَمَنْ يَهْجُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مِنْكُمْ وَيَمْدَحُهُ وَيَنْصُرُهُ سَوَاءُ And whether you attack the Prophet ﷺ or you praise him or you honor him or humiliate him, it doesn't actually matter. Meaning what? The Prophet ﷺ doesn't need you to honor him in order for him to be honored. وَجِبْرِيلٌ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فِينَا وَرُوحُ الْقُدُسِ لَيْسَ لَهُ كِفَاءُ And Jibreel, the Messenger of Allah, is amongst us. And the Holy Spirit has no match. Meaning, gather up who you want. We have Jibreel on our side. Find a match that's going to fight against Jibreel alayhi salam. So this was just a glimpse of the poetry of Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu that we find in, uh, in Sahih Muslim. And again, he always made it a point to extract the Prophet وسلم, skillfully uh, as he was responding to the Meccans and responding to their habits and things of that sort. Uh, one of the things that we see with Hassan عنه, once again is that the Prophet وسلم, said about Hassan, Allahumma ayyidhu bi ruh al Qudus, oh Allah, support him with Jibreel. And the Prophet وسلم, said that when Hassan stands up to speak on behalf of the Messenger, وسلم, the angel Jibreel supports him every single time he stands up to do so. So this is a man, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who is the spokesperson of the Prophet وسلم, in this regard. He's not a warrior, but he's very, very skilled at what he does, and he has a clear edge when it comes to his poetry. Now, what happens next in this story is, subhanAllah, once again, a sign that never think that you are safe from the plotting of the devil and from the, from the whispers that can come within you and from falling into something. And essentially, he falls into a grievous error. And that grievous error was that he was one of the people who spread the slander of Aisha radiallahu anha. When he heard Haditha ifk imagine he's the one who defends the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but as the slander is being passed around, and not everyone is slandering with the exact same terminology. But you know, there are people who are social commentators, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us from being people who are hasty with their tongues, right? Your tongue, talaqawnahu, your tongue meets the slander. And before you can even process it and think about whether or not you should verify it or the implications of that slander, when you become a social commentator, then you just quickly throw it out there. So it's not that Hassan radiallahu anhu is the chief hypocrite, Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, who purposely generates this, this slander of Aisha radiallahu anha, accusing her of, of zina, right? Accusing our mother radiallahu anha of some form of adultery. It's not that. It's that. Hassan anhu did not hold his tongue when he heard it and he ended up repeating it. Okay? This is a serious lesson, if you take a step back, that sometimes your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. Hassan had a quick tongue, anhu, and that quick tongue tricked him in this moment. Right? That quick tongue, quick intellect, when he heard something and he, was natu he naturally had that posture, right? of being combative and responding, he unfortunately took that and he spread it. Also keep in mind, he's an older man. So his, his filters are less, it just comes in and it goes out. And that is one of, the, uh, one of the sad things about his story, but something that we're going to learn a great lesson from. Now, this is the human side of us, right? That we have to talk through for a moment. When we talked about Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu and the three men that stayed behind, him being one of them, we said they're kind of the outliers because they're not the hypocrites who were making excuses to stay behind, nor were they like the believers who went forward. They're three men who got distracted and ended up missing Tabuk, right? But they're righteous companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Three people that ended up engaging the slander that were not the hypocrites at the time of Medina. The hypocrites were looking for any means of generating chaos and dysfunction and disunity within Medina. But three people, Mistah, who is the cousin of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to spend on him every single day. And he slandered his daughter. And what did we learn from Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu? 
when Allah when, when he found out that Mislah was one of those people who spread the slander, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, I've been spending on this guy all this time, I'm not going to give him any more charity. And what did Allah reveal? Forgive and pardon, don't you want Allah to forgive you? And imagine Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, I'm going to keep spending on the man that slandered my daughter. I'm going to forgive him. He sought forgiveness. Allah forgave him. I'm going to forgive him and I'm going to spend on him. He passed it. May Allah forgive him. And I will continue to spend on him even on the day that he's punished. SubhanAllah. So, Mislah radiallahu anhu was one of those who slandered. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was someone who said, I'm not going to allow the shaytan to take hold of me the way he took hold of Mistah for that moment. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu rose to the moment. That shows you the character of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Another person, the second, obviously Hassan is one, and then you have Mistah, and then you have Hamna bint Jash radiallahu anha. Hamna is the widow of Mus'ab ibn Umair. Right? Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu's widow is Hamna bint Jash, the sister of Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu anhu. The sister of Zainab bin Jahsh radiallahu anha. And she got caught up. So some people took it and just repeated it. And, you know, here's the thing that's important when you're talking about Haditha ifq the slander of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, that everyone expects the hypocrites to rumble about it and to do their thing. They're kind of a dismissed group of people amongst the Muslims in the sense that. You know, we expect this from the corners of Abdullah ibn Ubayman Saru and those who always try to wreak chaos amongst us. But when it comes from within, it gives it some level of credence, which makes it so much harder to distinguish, right, and to put things aside and to arrange them. So these three people are not munafiqeen, they're not hypocrites. They're three companions who made a serious mistake. And Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu happened to be one of those who made a serious mistake. Uh, mistake. Now, by the way, sometimes we forget there was another person that got slandered, not just Aisha radiallahu anha, but Safwan radiallahu anhu, the man who she was accused of, uh, you know, that, that, that horrific rumor with. And Safwan radiallahu ta'ala anhu was innocent. He didn't have a tribe. And all Safwan did was he was helping Aisha radiallahu anha when she got left behind. And he merely pulled her camel in and he kept his gaze away from her the entire time and he never engaged in anything that was indecent. Safwan didn't have a tribe. He didn't have people to protect him. Now Safwan had a human moment. Safwan, uh, radiallahu anhu, when he found out that Hassan ibn Thabit was one of those who said it, what Safwan does is he goes and he hides behind a path where Hassan radiallahu anhu would walk. And then when Hassan is walking out one day, Safwan basically jumps him. Safwan jumps on him and he says, He says, listen, it's actually a line of poetry. He said, I'm a man who when my blood boils, I don't know how to say poetic lines, I only know how to give a beating. So I'm not a poet like you, but you went too far. And Safwan basically jumps on him and starts beating on him, right? Now when that happens, this is chaos, right? This is what fitna does. This is what, this is what dissension does in a community, right? This is a community that's used to fighting off their enemies together, surviving all these plots. And now, unfortunately, this is penetrating on the inside. So, you know, some of Hassan's people walk by from Khazraj, from Banu Najjar. They see Safwan on top of him beating him, right? So they go and they pull Safwan off, they give him a few hits and they take Safwan to the Prophet ﷺ and Hassan anhu is covered in blood and Safwan anhu is covered in blood. And the thing is, is that the case of Hassan anhu has not yet been decided. Like Allah did not give revelation yet confirming who did what and sorting the things out. So Hassan anhu is covered in blood and technically speaking, Safwan anhu is in the wrong. Now naturally, humanly, if he heard that you're one of the people that said this, he had a human reaction, right? So he jumped him and he took justice into, an, into his own hands. And the Prophet ﷺ told Hassan, Ahsan ya Hassan, Ahsan ya Hassan. Let it go, O Hassan, let it go, O Hassan. Right? This is, you can understand why this is happening. Even if this was not the right way of rectification of this situation, 
It's understandable why it happened. Ahsan ya Hassan and the Prophet وسلم, diffused the situation even though, again, his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, has also been hurt with this. Now here's the thing. This story is actually one of the stories in which you really see the virtue of Aisha radiallahu anha, who we're going to have to do an extensive biography on her radiallahu ta'ala anha. Aisha radiallahu anha forgave all of the people that slandered her. And she would defend them in the presence of people who would attack them. All right? Hassan radiallahu anhu felt horrible for what he did, and he was punished. The revelation came down, and he was punished, as was Mistah, as was uh, Hamna bin Jahsh. But again, they're not excommunicated from the community. They're not people that no longer have a place within society. He made a serious mistake. So he says about Aisha radiallahu anha, when Aisha radiallahu anha uh, said, do not... Uh, don't say anything bad about Hassan He used to defend the Prophet You imagine subhanAllah how, how righteous this woman is She was hurt by him But she says But he used to defend the Prophet So if anyone started to say anything bad about Hassan Aisha radiallahu anha would step in and say No, no He used to defend the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Don't attack him don't think you're doing me any favors when you start to put him down in this regard. So he authors a poem about Aisha radiallahu anha. All right? He says, Hasanun razanun ma tuzannu bi ribatin wa tusbihu gartha min nuhum al ghawafili aqila tu hayyin min luayy ibn ghalib kiram al masa'i majduhum ghayru za'ili مهذبة قد طيب الله خيمها وطهرها من كل سوء وباطل فإن كنت قد قلت الذي قد زعمتم فلا رفعت سوطي إلي أناملي وكيف وودي ما حييت ونصرتي لآل رسول الله زين المحافل له رتب عال على الناس كلهم تقاصر عنه سورة المتطاول فَإِنَّ الَّذِي قَدْ قِيلَ لَيْسَ بِلَائِطٍ وَلَكِنَّهُ قَوْلُ مْرِئٍ بِمَاحِلِ This is so profound. He says, حَصَانٌ رَزَانٌ مَا تُزَنُّ بِرِيبَةٍ وَتُصْبِحُ غَرْثَ مِنْ لُحُومِ الْغَوَافِلِ So basically, she, he's praising Aisha radiallahu anha. He says, a chaste, pious woman who never backbites anyone. She never talks bad about anybody. And تُصْبِحُ غَرْثَ مِنْ لُحُومِ الْغَوَافِلِ uh, Gartha, she wakes up hungry, or you know, she, she basically starves herself from the meat of the unsuspecting. She starves herself from the meat of the unsuspecting. Now, let me break this down. Obviously, the, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likens gossip and backbiting to eating the dead meat of a person. And what he's saying is, Aisha radiallahu anha would never eat the meat of the unsuspecting person, she would never backbite an innocent person. So she's someone who, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter what happens, Aisha radiallahu anha never backbites. This shows you the uh, poetic nature of Hassan here, by the way. He says, the wife of the best man from Lu'ay ibn Ghalib. Lu'ay ibn Ghalib is the ancestor of the Prophet وسلم, and Aisha radiallahu anha. So a common ancestor, he basically went up the chain and he said, he praised the, you know, the, them as the children of their common ancestor. So he mentioned their common ancestor. And he says, Kiram al Masai, Majduhum Ghayru Zaidi. Honorable, noble people who will never fall. They never will fall out of grace, no matter what anyone says about them. Muhadzabatun, Qad Tayyib Allahu Khimaha, a woman of the best manners and from the best origins. وَطَهَّرَهَا مِنْ كُلِّ سُوءٍ وَبَاطِلِ And Allah protected her and purified her from every type of evil and every type of falsehood. فَإِن كُنْتُ قَدْ قُلْتُ الَّذِي قَدْ زَعَمْتُمْ So indeed if I said that which you have said, that I have said, فَلَا رَفَعَتْ صَوْتِ إِلَيَّ أَنَامِلِي Basically saying then let my hand not even be able to raise my, my whip towards me. So he's, he's saying may Allah paralyze me if I engaged in this slander in the way that some of you are saying I engaged. Some of the scholars are saying here, what Hassan is saying is that I was not one of those who was at the head here. Yes, I made a mistake and I said it when it came to me and I should have done better. But, you know, 
If I was one of those people who originated this and who took it to that level, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paralyze me. I have no right to, to continue onwards and walking onwards. And he says, And how could it be when I have sworn that as long as I live, my love and my, my passion is that I would defend the Prophet وسلم, and his family, the best man who ever lived. And he continues and he says, The Prophet has a rank that is way higher than anyone, uh, uh, anyone other than him. That even a person who has high ambitions to strive to become something great would still fall short of being like the Prophet and he said that what has been said could not be further from the truth, meaning about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, but was said by someone who spurns evil of the worst kind, who spurns fitna of the worst kind, which is of course, this originated with the enemy of the Prophet وسلم, the chief of the hypocrites who wanted to cause havoc and succeeded temporarily in causing havoc in the community of the Prophet وسلم, by trying to scandalize the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? So this is Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu in trying to you know, make up for what has happened. However, the stain of this mistake would live with him for the rest of his life. And there, is, there, there are multiple narrations about this afterwards. Hisham ibn Urwa, uh, Hisham ibn Urwa ibn Zubair. So I don't want to get, I don't want to lose you all here. Uh, but if you remember, Asma bint Abi Bakr was the wife of Az-Zubair, therefore the mother of Abdullah ibn Zubair and Urwa ibn Zubair. So therefore, the children of Asma bint Abi Bakr were the maternal nephews of Aisha radiallahu anha, which is why we have so much of the seerah, right? Urwa ibn Zubair used to enter upon Aisha and collect seerah, collect narrations from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha because they were the nephews of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So Urwa, uh, one time, what walked into the house of Aisha and saw Hassan ibn Thabit sitting there. And Hassan ibn Thabit lived to be 120 years old, radiallahu anhu, and went blind. And he walked in and he describes, he said, I saw Aisha radiallahu anha tukrimuhu, and she was honoring him. And so I started to curse him. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, no, no. No, no, he used to defend the Prophet We're not going to do that. And uh, when one of the times when she did that, Hassan anhu started to say the poem where he's praising her. And the first line of poetry was once again that she does not backbite, that she would never backbite. And Aisha anha said to Hassan in that moment, anta lasta kadhalik. But you're not like that. <laughs> you slipped. So you keep on saying this praise about not backbiting, not backbiting, but let's not forget you did make that mistake. So just because I'm defending you against these guys, I haven't forget, I have not forgotten that you also said those words. So, you know, basically Hassan radiallahu anhu, you know, jazakallah khair for defending the Prophet sallallahu but you don't have to keep on reciting that line of poetry uh, as if nothing uh, happened uh, in the past. And subhanAllah, there was one time where there were some uh, women that were doing tawaf with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and they saw Hassan radiallahu anhu and they started to say bad things about Hassan and she said la tasubbuhu do not do not say anything bad about Hassan radiallahu anhu and he, and she said waqad amiya and he's blind like he's old and he's blind and he used to defend the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam like there's no point don't fall to that and saying bad things about him and she said wallahi inni la arju أن يدخله الله الجنة بكلمات قالهن لأبي سفيان هجوت محمدا فأجبت عنه. She said, I swear by Allah that I hope Allah will enter him into Jannah for these lines that he said to Abu Sufyan, and it was the first poem that I recited in Sahih Muslim, the long poetry defending the Prophet ﷺ. So she said, No, no, we're not going to say anything bad about him. We will only speak good about him for the good that he did, and he's forgiven for the the bad that he uh, that he did. Ibn Abbas عنهما, had an incident where Hassan عنه, came in and someone, uh, a young person said, Qadima Hassan al 
the cursed Hassan came forward. And Ibn Abbas says, Wallahi ma huwa bil'ayn. How dare you say that? I swear by Allah, he's not a cursed person. No, this is a person that strove alongside the Prophet with his self and with his tongue. And he should not be put down because of this one mistake that he made. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu also. And this is, you know, subhanAllah, perhaps one of the things that shows you the spiritual maturity of the companions. The spiritual maturity of the companions. Right, that they saw people make significant mistakes and come back from those mistakes in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They saw people come back from apostasy, right? And some of the, the next generation, they couldn't handle, like, you know, they had this level of piety to live up to. And so they heard the good and the bad, and they took the bad sometimes, and they started to say things like that. So one time, Hassan anhu, as an old man, he noticed that some of the people were, were not treating him well. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was there. And he said, Ya Abu Huraira, I, oh, oh Abu Huraira, I ask you by Allah, Hal sami'ta Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, Ya Hassan, ajib an Rasulillah, Allahumma ayyidhu bi ruh al-Qudus. Didn't you hear the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Oh Hassan, uh, oh Allah, uh, support Hassan with Jibreel alayhi salam, with the Holy Spirit. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said, Allahumma na'am. I swear by Allah I heard it. Meaning, we shouldn't put Hassan radiallahu anhu down for that mistake. Instead, we should extol his virtue. He made a mistake, he sought forgiveness, and he was forgiven, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And ultimately, what he goes down in history as is not the man who slandered Aisha, radiallahu anha, but the man who defended the Prophet And it's important for us, sometimes, to come across stories like this from the companions. Sometimes. Because redemption is to the gravity of the mistake. And so this was a serious path back because he didn't just commit any sin, he committed the sin of slander. And he didn't just slander any person, he slandered Aisha radiallahu anha. But the Prophet ﷺ made a way back for him and the Prophet ﷺ honored him, he forgave him. Aisha radiallahu anha forgave him. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu forgave him. And ultimately, of course, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it so that he would go down as the poet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the one al-mu'ayyad bi ruh al-qudus the one who was supported by jibril alayhi salam as we said he lived 120 years and subhanallah ibn sa'ad said asha 60 sana fil jahiliya wa 60 sana fil islam it's interesting subhanallah he lived 60 years before islam and 60 years in islam 60 years in the days of ignorance and 60 years in islam and became a person who would of course uh, you know, uh, still go down as the legend of the poet that he was. But it's interesting, and I'll end with this as well. None of the poetry that he did on behalf of any of those tyrants, none of the poetry that he did, the diss poetry and the hit poetry of the time, is preserved. Which tells you something, right? That what is not done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes down in the dustbins of history and absolutely has no relevance whatsoever that Hassan radiallahu anhu was celebrated and it was a test for him to give that up to become a Muslim. Because Hassan radiallahu anhu, you know what he could have done? He could have took money from the people of Medina. Imagine how much the hypocrites would have paid him to make poetry against the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine if he went to Mecca and joined the ranks of those people that were hurting the Prophet ﷺ in every way and wrote poetry against the Prophet ﷺ. But instead he chose to use his skill on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ and we have the beautiful poetry that he, uh, that he spoke on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be pleased with him, to forgive him, and to allow us to be amongst those people that defend our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the most beautiful of ways. Allahumma ameen. Uh, I believe before we cut, we have a brother who actually is going to take shahada inshaAllah Ta'ala with us. So we're not going to do the questions and answers inshaAllah. Would you like to do it now or you want to do it after? I caught you off guard, didn't I? Do you want to wait till after the prayer, or would you rather do it now? After the prayer, okay. So inshallah, we will do it after uh, the prayer, inshallah ta'ala. So those of you that are here, please uh, stay behind after Salat al-Isha, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we'll be uh, giving shahada to our brother. And inshallah, next week, next week we're going to talk about Nusayba Um Ammara radiallahu ta'ala anha. So inshallah, please do join us next week as well for Nusayba. بن كعب رضي الله تعالى عنها وصلى الله وسلم بارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته